Okay, good morning everyone. Today is Parshas Bishalach. And the highlight of this Parsha, we all know, is the splitting of the sea and the Shira, the song that the Jewish people sang on the sea. Uh, that is a printing mistake. Okay, thank you. Well, the truth is, this is a class that can go either for Parsha Shmos, you can go for any one of these four Parshas, because really what we're going to do today is we're going to run a thread through all four Parshios. So really, I could have given it at the beginning, I could give it at the end, depending on what I wanted to say, but you're right, it, can, it goes for any one. Okay, let's do a little bit of word association for a minute. Okay, I say a word, and you... Tell me the first thing that comes to your mind. The first thing. Don't even think. If you think, it doesn't count. All right? Okay. The word is Moshe. Rabbeinu. Rabbeinu. I was going to say Aaron. Aaron. Okay. Stick. Stick. Prophet. Prophet. Torah. Torah. Leader. Leader. <laughs> okay. <coughs> Pretty good. But nobody picked... The word Shabbos. You're all looking at me strangely. Now, many people don't see a connection between Moshe and Shabbos. But that's precisely what we're going to talk about today, amongst other things. And uh, in, the, in the book of Shmos that we started four weeks ago, Hashem gave us a beautiful gift. And that gift is Moshe Rabbeinu. And even though he lived thousands of years ago, Again, the power of the Parshios, uh, as we see at, at current events, always rela relate to the Parshios and the energies that the Parshios bring into the world. So Moshe Rabbeinu, this time of year, always comes to help us out. And in order to really appreciate what Moshe Rabbeinu gives us, uh, we will then be able to appreciate the gift that Moshe gave us, which is the gift of Shabbos. And as we know in the first source, we say in the Shachris Davning, Yismach Moshe b'matanas chelko. Moshe rejoiced over the gift of his portion. And what was this gift? The Abu Draham commentary says, and other commentaries say, it was the gift of Shabbos. Many of the rabbis tell us that Moshe Rabbeinu is connected to Shabbos more than any other human being. Is, was, will be connected to Shabbos more than anybody else. We also know there's a special psalm that we say three times on Shabbos, and when we begin the Shabbos, it's Mizmor Shir Liyoyim HaShabbos. That's the second source. And uh, if you know, if you just take the Hebrew letters, Mizmor Shir Liyom HaShabbos, the first letters, Mem Shin Lamed Hey, is to change them around, it spells Limosha. Limosha. And the truth of the matter is, the Medrash tells us, that who made up this psalm originally was Adam Rishon. Adam Rishon made up this psalm of Mizpah Shir Liyom HaShabbos. Then it fell into disuse. And then Moshe came and prophetically restored it. So we see that the gift of Shabbos is uniquely connected to Moshe Rabbeinu. Somehow he was able to revive the Shabbos of the first man. Somehow from the time of first man we had a Shabbos and it was lost. And Moshe gave Shabbos back to the Jewish people. So there's a big connection between Moshe and Shabbos. How did he give it back to us? So we know the famous Midrash, the third source. When Moshe saw the burdens of the Jewish people, he saw they had no rest. The Jews were working seven days a week. So Moshe Rabbeinu, uh, then as the prince of Egypt, and still uh, with allegiance to Paro, suggested that Paro should get greater productivity out of the Jewish people by giving them a day of rest. If you rest them one day, you'll get more out of six days of work than working them seven days in a row. So he figured, you know, he says to them, you'll maximize their productivity. Really, that wasn't what he had in mind. He had in mind much more important things for the Jewish people, but that's what he gave them. So you could certainly appreciate how the Jews, when they got Shabbos, how excited they were to get it. Can you imagine working seven days a week and now to get a Shabbos? It was amazing for them. And, uh, and that was the gift that Moshe gave to the Jewish people, as it were. And uh, Reb Tzadok says in the fourth source, he says, when it says this is his portion, he says the root of Moshe's holiness comes from the Shabbos. And not just any Shabbos, but the Shabbos of all Shabboses, which is Olam Haba. 
the world to come. So Moshe is very much rooted in the Shabbos. His soul is intertwined with Shabbos itself, which is which the Shabbos itself is rooted in the end of all time. So Moshe on his own was able to devise a plan to bring Shabbos back to the Jewish people in Egypt. Okay, so that is really one of the strongest word associations with Moshe Rabbeinu is Shabbos. Now on the other hand, you also mentioned Torah. Somebody mentioned Torah. That goes together with him being Rabbeinu. So we now see though that Moshe is the essence, Shabbos is the essence of Moshe's soul. And every year at this time, we come back to that. Now, now there's another important thing we have over here. They know there are four elements that exist in the world. What are the four elements? Fire, water, wind, and earth. Right? So, if we look at the four elements, which element is so dominant in this story? The answer is water. And whenever things become often in any Torah narrative, you've got to, you've got to stop and take a notice. I made a little list over here. So you don't have to write so many notes here. There are 10 <laughs> things, at least that I found, maybe you'll find more, from the beginning of the story of Egypt till the Jews leave. 10 incidents of water. Number one, the Nile River. That was a pretty important part of the story. That's the God of Egypt. Number two, the Egyptian astrologers are able to foretell that the demise of the Jewish Savior will be through water which to a certain degree was true. But initially they thought it was directly through water and that is why number three, the Jewish baby boys were thrown into the Nile River. Okay, now how does Moshe Rabbeinu survive? Moshe is put into a basket by the river in the water. The daughter of Paro just you know, apparently, coincidentally, right? Seemingly coincidentally, is bathing in the Nile River when she finds Moshe Rabbeinu. Moshe's name, the word Moshe means mean hamayim mishisu, from the water he was drowned out, drawn out, right? The first two plagues, first plague is on water, second one, Svardea, comes from the water, okay? When the Jewish people in this week's Parsha want to leave Egypt, what was Moshe Rabbeinu busy doing? Trying to find Yosef's coffin, Joseph's coffin. Where was Joseph's coffin? It was submerged at the bottom of the Nile River. And Moshe Rabbeinu had to miraculously get the coffin out of the river. And of course, we finally culminated this week's Parsha again with the Sea of Reeds splitting in half and the Egyptians drowning in the water. Now, isn't that a lot of water for one story? So when, when you come across this, you've got to understand, we've got to understand something about water to understand this story. You understand? So we got to explore three issues today. Hopefully we'll get all three done. Number one, where does water fit into this entire story of the Jewish people? Number two, where does Moshe fit into Shabbos? And number three, what's the connection between Shabbos and the Jewish servitude in Mitzrayim? Those are the three, and, and, the, and, and, and the exodus as well, going out of Mitzrayim. Where does that fit in? All right, so these are the three issues we have to talk about. And hopefully if we'll have time at the end, we'll understand why it is a very strong minhag, very strong minhag, that Jews eat fish on Shabbos unless they're allergic to it. But otherwise, you're really supposed to eat fish at all three meals, and especially at Shalashudas, that fish. Hopefully in the next hour, you will know why. Okay? And the, all customs that Jews have is not little things. It's not like, you know, it's not like the corn that the pilgrims ate uh, for their Thanksgiving meal with the, with the Indians. You know, there's real reasons why we do everything. So we're going to see why is it that Jews eat fish. Now, you can eat any kind of fish you like, you know, but, uh, uh, but we do eat fish. So when we get to that part, you know, we're coming to the end of the class. Okay. So now we're going to talk about for the next 10 to 15 minutes about a, this is the main concept. Once we have the main concept and you got the idea, we can work a lot of amazing things with this. And the topic now is going to be two words we're going to talk a lot about. The first word is called Chomer, and the second word is called Surah. The Maral, as well as many other rabbis, 
have an overall way of looking at the world and how, how they decompartmentalize the world. And he looks at reality and divides it up into two domains. One is called Chomer. Chomer literally means matter. Matter as in physical matter. And Tzura means shape or form. And he uses these terms frequently in his writings. So let's explain these terms. I'm going to spend a lot of time explaining because if you don't understand the terms and the way he applies them, then we're just not going to understand any of the thing we're going to go with today. So let's take an example. Let's say a person who is a sculptor. A sculptor, and I'm not an expert in this, so if I make any mistakes, I, I, I plead uh, ignorance in this, but imagine they, they start with a hunk of clay or a hunk of rock or whatever, and then they start working with it. Either they're shaping it or they're chiseling or whatever. And let's say the person is trying to make a, take it and make a statue of a king. Okay? So what do we have? We have a lot of homer, a lot of matter, that's rock, a big chunk of rock that was taken out of a mountain or wherever the rock was taken from. The sculptor looks at the king or the, the object that he wants to sculpt and he looks at this block of rock and says, I'm going to make this block of rock turn into a sculpture of the king. So, getting our terms here. So, the tsura, the tsura, the form, is whatever the sculptor wants the rock to represent. On the other hand, the matter of the rock is the physical matter of the rock from which the figure is sculpted from. So therefore, tsura really means the inner content, or we'll say spiritual essence of something, while chomer um, is something without any particular meaning. Chomer has no real essence. It's just physical matter that is there to be Manipulated. A human being, another example, a human being is made out of chomer, chomer, flesh and blood. But we can give him a tsura and call him Yassi Mahalos. And now he has a tsura. Everything that Yassi Mahalos represents is now the definition of the essence of what all that chomer, all that physical matter is all about. So now, in his writings, the Maral says that whenever we encounter Sura, we find the power of Hashpa'a, giving, shaping. And Sura has the power to give something its meaning and its content. Uh, the human being is Chomer, flesh and blood. Human being, by the physical part, is a Goylem. And only when Sura is infused into the Chomer, does the Tzura give the Chomer meaning, direction, content, goals? Therefore, the role of Tzura is to influence and change reality and uplift and define reality. That's, the, uh, that's what Tzura is. Chomer is what we call in Hebrew the Mikabel, the recipient of the Tzura. It stands in waiting for the Tzura to do something to it. Just like the stone is standing in waiting to be shaped by the sculptor into a statue, so now, or you take a piece of wood, same thing, it's chomer, you could take that piece of wood, you could shape it into a table, and now it has tzura. All right? So the chomer has gained a tzura through the manipulations that went to it. It's got a form, now it has characteristics, it has purpose. Uh, you can learn Torah by this table, you can recite Kiddush at this table, and now that wood has a tzura, it was given a tzura. So you see that all physical matter, chomer, lies dormant, waiting for this hashpa'a, this influence, this enlightenment of the tzura that will give the chomer its definition and meaning. So when man was created, we saw it was dust from the ground, and when God blew a soul into man, he gave him a tzura, and he became a human being. So in short, Surah is the mashpia, is the influencer, the giver, and chomer is the mushpa, the influencee. Okay, that is the idea. All right, does everybody understand the terms now? Pretty much, we'll apply them now in the story. But those are the two terms, chomer and surah. So now, with this, we can look at source number five and begin to appreciate Moshe Rabbeinu and begin to appreciate what kind of people we might be. So the Maral says in the fifth source, he gives a better understanding of the concepts of slavery and freedom 
based on these concepts of Homer and Surah. So he writes, he says, it's not befitting for Talmidei Chachomim, people who study Torah, someone who's a tzaddik, a person who really is imbued with what the message of God and Torah is all about. He says, it's not fitting that a Talmud Chacham to ever be enslaved. Why? Because slavery and a Talmud Chacham are incompatible. Why? Because anyone who is a slave, by definition, is being influenced by a master. This idea of being influenced by an external force applies only to beings who are really Homer based. A form that is separated beyond the matter which he calls Surah Hanivdelas. Sura is shaped, Nivdel means separated, beyond form as it were. That's the term he calls it, Surah Hanivdelas. Same thing as Surah. He says, can never be influenced by an outside force. What does he mean? He explains this. The pure intellect that a person has, the pure intellect that the person has, that's molded by Torah and God's understanding of reality, is separated from the person's Chomer. And since it's not a being of Chomer, it doesn't get influenced by Chomer. And once it can't be influenced, it's not possible to be enslaved. And therefore, it doesn't make any sense that a Talmud Chacham, who has what he calls Seichel Hanivdelas, has this intellect that's separated, the Tzura Hanivdelas, it's not possible to enslave such a person because he has pure intellect and an intellect that can shape and form the human being as opposed to being shaped. That's what the morale says. So now let's explain those words. Okay. We can look what he's doing now, he's telling us, let's look at Homer and Surah relationship as a similar to the relationship of master and servant. The Homer is the servant and the Surah is the master. And when you have a master and servant relationship, who is shaping and who is forming? It's the master. Obviously, the master is shaping the servant. The master gives identity, he gives purpose, and he gives mission to the servant, and the servant is taking the orders. The servant identifies with what the goals of the master are, and the master will really make the servant what he is. Whatever the particular needs of the master are, is or are, the master will influence that fate of the servant. And the one who is enslaved, therefore, is like the matter. He has no content, he has no purpose, and no destination beyond what the master wants. Okay, so the morale, let's give you, now this all sounds very interesting, let's, let's uh, it's, it's um, um, theoretical. So let's give some real examples, so you'll see what, what, what this really means. So the morale in another place gives an example, he talks about anger. Okay, we define people now, now you get the term Sura and Homer, now we define people as either being a Baal Surah, which literally means a master of Surah, or a Baal Homer, or a master of mass. Is he, is he, is, in other words, there's a master of form and a master of matter, which really isn't a master of all. It means he just has the essence of matter. So if you're a Baal Surah, a master of form, an influencer and a shaker and a mover, and a person has good sense of self, well, the fact that the bus comes late on a rainy day and you've been standing in the rain for 25 minutes in the cold weather and there's a bus that just goes right by you and doesn't bother to stop for you, you're not going to kick and scream at, in anger over that bus that went by. Why? Because it doesn't befit a Baal Tzura to lose his temper. A Baal Tzura is the active one. He defines, he influences. He doesn't get influenced. Right? On the other hand, the Baal Chomer, the person of matter, he's tossed around like the wind. And if a person is a Baal Kas, a person gets angry, presents an ability to get angry, he really is a person who's acted upon. He is the, the Nispoel, he's acted upon. And he is the person who really is enslaved. You act upon him and he becomes a piece of clay and molded according to your directions and instructions. We know people with tempers, we know they have buttons. And all we need to do is push the button and look, watch him go. You just know, person with tempers, they always have their red flags. 
you m m mention a certain topic, the guy goes out of control. He just can't control himself. Every spouse knows the other, if they have an angry spouse, they know exactly which buttons to push and to bring out the greatest amount of anger. Now isn't that person who is the angry person who's getting his buttons pushed or her buttons pushed, isn't that the manifestation of Homer? It's matter that's being shaped and molded to the degree that the shaper wants to shape and mold the person. So that's a good example of a person who's steeped into Homer. Okay. Uh, you know, certain people, you just say one thing and they, and they fly off the handle, going crazy. Because that's the kind of person they are. When we talk about Surah Nivdelet, the separated form, we're talking about a form that's not connected to matter. And this is defined by a person's spiritual content versus physical matter. Okay, now this is what the morale is saying, that you can never enslave a person who is a Baal Surah, because he's not affected or influenced by outside forces. That's why you can never really enslave a proper Talmud Chacham because he uses his intellect and he shines with surah, with depth, with essence and therefore slavery is incompatible to such a person. How can a person who is a master of intellect and Torah and good deeds and connection to deep spiritual ideas be controlled by someone else? It's just the opposite. It's the Talmud Chacham who's must be in others, who really is able to control, in a good way, to control and influence others. Therefore, this is what the morale is saying. The key to whether a person will be slave or free is determined in whether he's a Baal Chomer or a Baal Tzura. Are you a person who's like a lump of clay, totally connected to the physical reality and can be manipulated by every outside force? Or are you a Talmud Chacham, the one of the Seichel Nivdelet, this separated intellect, the Tzura, that's behind the manipulation of, it's beyond rather, the manipulation of outside forces, and that intellect of such a person has a good sense of self. So now, what did Hashem call Egypt in the Ten Commandments? It was called the Beis Avodim, the house of slavery. Egypt connotes a place that breeds slavery and uh, thrives on enslavement. The morale says that Egypt was a land that was totally hooked into physicality. It was such a physical world. There was no country in the world at that time was that was so totally committed to the world of physical pleasures as Egypt was. And the sign of a Baal Chomer, a person's into Chomer, is that he's enslaved to his desires. And that's what Egypt was. Even if you weren't a slave, even if you were a free Egyptian, you were enslaved to the desires of your physical pleasures of the world. So, so certainly um, a person who, who was less wealthy or less socially endowed could be literally enslaved by the Egyptians. Uh, and, what, and that happened was in order to let the so-called free Egyptians make themselves more slaves themselves. The masters themselves were only making themselves slaves by getting into more physical, getting other people to do more physical things to you that was really controlling you. So even the masters in Egypt were really slaves to their own desires and they would enslave other people from that as well. So that's what Egypt was all about. So let, let's give an example. All right, let's say it's uh, late at night. It's a freezing cold winter night. You have to imagine that a little bit. It's been cold for a while. It's momish freezing. It's 10 to 8 at night. You're nestled on the easy chair. You're watching uh, whatever is, is, is on the television or you're, you know, you're reading a good book, whatever. And the surah comes to you and says, get up. In 10 minutes, the rabbi is giving a class in the shul. Right? So he says, listen, you hunk of flesh, get up, get up, get your hunk of flesh out of the easy seat and let's, uh, let's go to shul. Because your hunk of flesh, you know, if we sold it on the market, is only worth about four and a half bucks in terms of the, of the material, the natural resources that you have, right? It's time to get going. That's what the Tzura says. And the Chomer says, I ain't going to class. <laughs> Why? I just like it the way it is. I'm just a hunk and I don't want to be m moved. Not that using any intellect here, it's just saying I'm not interested. So Mitzrayim was that house of slavery because it's where Homer ruled. You know, we, we all have a lot of Homer 
You know, that's where gravity comes into play. We like to be rooted in one place and really something else has to really work you over to, to make you and shape you and do something with you. Right? That, that's the way it is. So, so it was in this world that Moshe Rabbeinu was born. And the Hasidic masters say, even but once Moshe was just born, the state of slavery was diminished significantly. Just his presence, his aura did that. Because Moshe was the opposite of slavery. Moshe was the pure intellect, was the pure tzura. And that's why he would be the one to get Torah. And therefore he reached, a level morale says, he reached the shleimus malus at tzura. He reached the highest level that a human being could reach in terms of this tzura, being able to be a shaper and identify with reality and be able to shape himself and to shape others and the Jewish people. And obviously that's where the Torah comes into play over here. So it had to be the person who would take the Jews out of the house of bondage. The house of slavery has to be the freest person of all. And that's the Talmud Chacham is the freest person of all. That's point number one. All right, we're okay? We're okay? So far it's okay. Now, what would you say? How many of us are free people today? How many free people do you see in the world? Well, there's a continuum. Right? But as I've always said, to much to people's chagrin, and people will argue with this all day long, but I don't care. You know, anyone who feels they have to change their wardrobe because somebody said so, is acting out in that area, the area of Homer. Just because somebody said that the style now is this, and, you, and as soon as they snap, you say, how high should I jump and how much money shall I pay? You know, that is exactly what Homer is. That's exactly what Homer is. I, I still don't get it. You know, I'm open to having people explain it to me. They'll say, well, everybody does it. So I just say, they're all a bunch of Homer Nicks. You know, I'm not talking about where your clothes are wearing out. They wear out, they don't, you worn them out. Of course you have to get in I'm not saying people should not dress uh, properly. You shouldn't go with uh, holes in your jacket and, and things like that. And, and if it's broken, you should replace it. But the fact that you have to be up to date, you know, there are people, I'm told, who have closets full of clothing that's perfectly useful. And they're, they've hardly been worn. But you have to get a new wardrobe because that's the new style means that somebody in France has a very strong power of tsura and there's millions of chomers that are willing to do whatever the guy says and there isn't even any intelligent reason to do it. Now, I, we're not gonna, I'm not going to change the world, but I, I just don't get it. You know, it, it's not that we're saying that like we should not give up our togas from two and a half thousand years ago. Okay, but you want to look like an idiot with a toga? I'm saying, you know, you know, there, there are different, uh, you know, so it, it's a two-button suit, no, three-button. What's in the two-button suit and the three-button suit? You want to tell me? And if it's a double-breasted, single-breasted, a chvase, like, what, what does it matter? What does it matter? Are you any less of a person? Now, I have, how many you got here? Two, three buttons. Okay, what if now all of a sudden, no, you have to have two buttons. No, I, I, do I look so out of place with a three-button jacket, suit, not a two-button jacket? Right, and if, you know, if the lapels have to be, you know, and then one day there's like no lapels, right? It's, you have to look like this, it looked like Nehru, right? There was a time where the Nehru jacket was in style, right? I think that looked ugly, as a matter of fact, it didn't stay very long, right? But they all jumped t together. I remember when I was a teenager, the Nehru jacket was the, the big thing. All my friends had to get one. You, play, you have to get one, because everybody gets one. So, like, it totally don't use your mind. As long as the checkbook is, is wide enough, you go and buy it. Right? And that's the way it is with so many other things in life. So that's where the realities of Homer are. Now the clever person, there are very many um, um, entrepreneurial people who use their power of tsura to have all the Homers follow them and just spend more and more money buying things that they totally don't need. And therefore, that's where advertising has to come in because after they have to find a way to convince you to spend another $3,000 on a wardrobe because you have six wardrobes already from the last six years. So they've got to find a way to be able to control your mind to do something that makes no sense. Right? So that this is a, a disturbing example, but, but, and there's many other examples of this. We, we make decisions in life based on what other people manipulate us. You know, so that, that is the Homer we live in. And we live in this world, and we hope in these parshas to get out of that world. To get out of that world. So now, how does this all relate to water? 
That's all. Yes, ma'am. How did Moshe become such a bouncer? Was he born that way? He was, Moshe was born that way, and he had parents who were born that way. Remember, he had great parents. He came from a, a, a stock of very good ancestors. He comes from the tribe of Levi, he was A. B, his, really, who raised him? His mother raised him, A. And Bishya, Paro's daughter, who we found, find out, it becomes a convert to Yiddishkeit. So, she, so she, he had good influence from his parents. He had such a soul, and then he made the choices to do that himself. So that, that, that's everything he raised. He had a lot going for him, and still all, he had to make the choices. He had to choose becoming the, 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 the prince of Egypt or to become a person, morally principled person. And that was the choice he had to make, and he made the right choice. Yes, ma'am? Um, if Moshe had to stay, I mean, if he had to raise a slave, um, would Moshe have been considered a good person? Because he would have been able to... If Moshe was not in the palace, would he have been able to do this? Yes. No. And that's why God... Good question. And that's why God fortuitously made the events happen the way they did. I mean, Moshe Rabbeinu would have been uh, would have been a, a regular Jew. He would not have had enough to be able to go outside of the box. The fact he was raised in royalty, so again, even even to the degree that Paro was a Russia, but Paro certainly knew elements of Tzura. Even though Paro himself was a slave, but he knew how to use <coughs> manipulating other people to further his own slavery. Moshe saw at least. Oh, I see what it means to be able to manipulate. But now he would do it in a kosher way, as opposed to not kosher. That's a, Hashem's divine plan to put him in a place where he could sit back and be able to look at things and see them properly. Yeah? So was his brother and sister a major influence as well? For sure. Miriam, for sure, was a major player in this. And Aaron as well. Certainly they, they, they were part of that. Now, let's get to the water now. So now, what do we know about Moshe Rabbeinu? So we said that the daughter, what happened? Moshe was put in a little basket, he's put in the water. The daughter of Paro stretched out his, her arm to draw the baby. And she gave him the name Moshe. Moshe means that what she drew him out of the water. That's what it literally means. Moshe means being drawn out of the water. So we know a person's name is the person's essence. So now the morale comments about this. Uh, and it's very interesting, it's very unusual that Paro's daughter would give Moshe an Egyptian name and that's the one that seems to stick. Of all the names, that Mo Moshe had a lot of names, Moshe had ten names. Right? Tovia was one of the names, he had a lot of names. But this is the one that stuck. So morale comments on this. And now we have to go do another interesting piece and then with the, that piece will, everything will now fall into place very nicely. So look at the sixth source. In the beginning of the world, before anything was created, it says that Hashem's spirit, whatever it means, Hashem's spirit hovered over the water. And as creation moved on, God separated the higher waters and the lower waters. And then finally, what did Hashem do? He had all the water collect in one area and the dry land collect in another area. And that was uh, what we had. Now, the interesting word that is used, the Torah says, is Yikavu Hamayim. Yikavu Hamayim. Let the waters gather together. That word you got to remember now. I put in the brackets there in number six. Yikavu Hamayim. What does Yikavu mean? Right, source number six. Let the waters beneath heaven be gathered into one area. Yikavu Hamayim. And let the dry land appear. So Yikavu can come from the word to gather together but there really could be two explanations one is as we say like what other word sounds like yikavu the same root kuf vav mikveh mikveh and yikavu it's the same kuf and vav come together what's a mikveh mikveh what's the literal meaning of the word mikveh and what does a mikveh mean in Hebrew it means a gathering of water that's what a mikveh means not a ritual pool we go into a mikveh means together so the water gathers in one place so in terms of creation the water was mixed up all around. Hashem said all the water has to gather and retreat and stay in the oceans to make room for man who's going to walk on the earth. So on one hand, Yikavu means to gather, step aside, make room for man. The Medrash now says there's a second meaning. Yikavu can come from the word Yikuf Vav again, Tikveh. 
Tikva. What's Tikva? Hatikva. What's Hatikva? The hope. Anticipation. So the same root, Yikavu, can mean gather, can also mean anticipation. So what's the anticipation for the water? So Hashem said like this. It's a double meaning and they're both true. The waters, Yikavu, stand aside, gather yourself in another place, make room, man is going to rule the world. And you can't make, make, make any trouble. You've got to stay in your place. If the water's all over the place, man cannot live on planet Earth. If the waters are in the oceans, and they stay in the rivers, and you have the dry land, the man can do what he's meant to do. But God said to the waters, but you can always hope. You can always hope that one day you get out of your retreated position. And one day you'll be able to once again flood the Earth as well. If man does not do what he is supposed to do. And this has been the constant battle uh, between the mankind and the water. And this is the almost the, uh, uh, the love-hate relationship that the sailors have with the water. There's an amazing thing that, you know, man and water, and, you know, you, you've seen this uh, with tsunamis and things like that, flash floods and all these things. It's not just a simple thing. Whenever you look at floods and this kind of damage, you have to begin to understand, based on the measures, what's really going on over here. The human being was created with the ability to be the surat ha'olam, the shaper of the world. Not only does human being have an ashama to be a tzura for his own body and shape and mold his own body and give meaning and purpose and confidence to his own body, but really, the real, quote-unquote, fashion maker of the world is the human being. Human being has that tzura to be a fashion maker in a productive way because the human being gives the whole world context, meaning, and purpose. The human being is the whole reason why God created the world. Without the human being, the world has no purpose. So everything in this world, directly or indirectly, is influenced by the human being. So the human being is really the ultimate surah, the ultimate shaper, the surah to olam, the fashion designer of the world, of the olam, which is the olam hachomer, the world of matter in its natural state, must submit to man. Because man is the fashion designer of the world. And the rule is, surah always is more powerful and controls chomer. And that's the way it's supposed to be. And Hashem says, water, move over. Man is in control. Therefore, we understand that when man came into the world, what was one of the first things man did? He named all the animals. Now, naming all the animals was not just stop pulling out names out of a hat and just deciding. Adam was using his searing intellect of Tzura to say, I'm defining what this is and what the purpose of each and every animal is going to be. It's not just a name. Every animal, the Hebrew word that Adam associated with it means, and this is what this type of animal will be used and make its purpose in this world. The horse has this purpose. The donkey has this purpose. The fish has this purpose. And now they have meaning and, and purpose in this world because of the content that I gave them. I am the mashpi, I am the influencer, and I am saying what these animals are all about. So now, in the Torah we are told that there are three stories where people are described as riding on a donkey. You know what they are? Three people in the Torah, it says riding on a donkey especially. Number one was Avraham, number two was Moshe, and number three according to tradition is the Mashiach. Oni roche val a poor man riding on a donkey. Now, what's so special about a donkey? So the Hebrew word for donkey is a chamor. Has the same letters as chomer, matter, earthliness. There's a tremendous similarity between a donkey and matter because the donkey is the most physical creature along. You know, you ride on the donkey, rule over it. Donkeys don't complain about nothing. You put more load on it. You put more load on it till it falls, doesn't say anything. It just takes and takes and takes whatever you give it. So a donkey epitomizes the animal that is the most earthly. Has, has nothing to say, nothing to shape. It just takes it. And therefore, the symbolism of riding on a donkey means the master of Tzura who's controlling the Chomer. Whenever you see somebody riding on a donkey in Tanakh, that's always mean that's a good guy. Riding a horse doesn't mean anything. Riding on the donkey means you're on top of the donkey. Now, uh, and therefore... Avram was a man who controlled his physical desires. Moshe was a tremendous Baal Tzura, And the Mashiach will also be an earth shaker in the world. 
And really, Mashiach means the ultimate control that we have over the physical world. Interesting. Who do you see the opposite with? Bilam. Bilam. Bilam, where what? His donkey talks to him. Right? So that means the animal of Chomer, the most Chomer animal, was above Bilam. Because Bilam was so hedonistic that, uh, that he had more pleasures for the physical world than his donkey did. Right? So the human being is supposed to be a tsura, riding and controlling the physical world, using it for its purpose into the domain of holiness. Now, there is a big problem that the human being has to contend with. What is the arch nemesis of the human being in a symbolic point of view? The morale says it is water. Now, you're never going to look at water the same and after the next five minutes. Whenever you're going to see water in the Torah, you have to understand it this way. He says that water is the ultimate chomer presence in the world. Even more than the donkey. And the reason why that is so, says the morale, is that water has absolutely no form or shape. Uh, I want to always mix up the words. It, it either has, it, in terms of viscosity, viscosity means it's thicker, right? Is it, is it more? Th so it has probably the least viscosity. Like even thick liquids have some form to the degree that it's, it's, it's a viscous mass, right? But water is like so, like zero. It's just, it just goes all over the place. Can, can't say, and if it stays in any place, it's because it's in something that's giving it its shape. You, you could look at a, a, a rectangular shaped swimming pool and say the water is shaped rectangular. No, only because it's in a rectangular pool. All of a sudden put it in a circle pool, a round pool, now it's shaped circle. And if there's nothing at all, it just keeps rolling and rolling. It doesn't have any place to go. Interesting. Has no shape, has no form per se. I mean, I'm not going to the molecular level, obviously, but if the naked eye has no shape, has no form. More than that. Whatever you add to it, it will take. It's not going to refuse anything, you know. For example, look at the ocean. What if you want to put the Titanic into it? Is it going to say, I haven't got room for you? You could put the Titanic into it. You could put a, an elephant into the ocean. Uh, if you want, I mean, God should spare us. Maybe one day Los Angeles will go right into the ocean. Right? No problem. Water takes it all in. It's not very selective. It's, it'll take anything. It'll take anything. Right? Uh, in contrast, the Baal Tzura, the person with Tzura, is very selective with his taste. He doesn't take in everything. You know, there's a word in Hebrew called honor. Uh, uh, how do you say honor in Hebrew? Kavod. Kavod is the same letters as kaved, which means heavy. What does heaviness have to do with honor? Because the, of the more a person has self-honor, or we'll call self-esteem, the more he'll be set in his ways, and it'll be hard to change his opinion. Because the person has a certain sense of dignity. And the two agree there's a certain amount, a healthy amount of cover that a person should have. There's an unhealthy amount as well. But that with, a, with a healthy amount, so generally everyone has to have a little bit of cover for himself, a sense of dignity, a sense of independence, a sense of tsura, and that adds heaviness, that I'm not going to take everything that people give me. The person who has his own self worth says, I don't, I don't do that stuff. That's not for me. I don't take everything. Water is the antithesis of tsura. The antithesis. What do you know about water? Water is extremely light. Now I know you said, what do you mean? It's a heavy thing of water. That's when you put a lot of water together. A little bit of water is very light. And the water is saying, you know, come inside, I'll take it all. You know, when, when you call a person Hebrew, they call a person a cow. They call a person, he, he's a cow. He's a light person. It means that, you know, whatever you tell him to do, he goes with the flow. He's like a chameleon. He's, he's, he, 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 different companies of people, he acts differently. Uh, the more chomer something is, the less spiritual it is, the less permanent it is, the less directional it is. Can't water give life? Okay, we'll talk about that. I don't know if we'll have time for that. that, that that's a whole good question, and I, I need a whole... It's a good question. I need another class to explain that. It, it's a good question, but I, I, I got only another 20 minutes or so, so I'm, it, it's a good question. Um, 
Now, so, so water is the quintessential manifestation of Homer in the world. It doesn't oppose anything. It, it flows with the tide. At the same time, it will dissolve and corrode things. It will seek to cover up the whole world with its presence because it's so homer. That's the whole symbolism of the waves going ashore. The water really is yelling to me, I want to take over the world. That's what the water is saying. I want to take over the world. I want the world to be a homer world. And God says, no, you have to stop at this point. But there's always this battle. The bad thing you see the water, you know, it looks so pretty here at the seashore. We have to know the deeper message is the water wants to take over the world. The homer wants to take over the world. Does not want Surah to conquer it. And that's why wicked people are, are referred to the raging waters. Okay, so now, that's the ongoing battle between man and the water. And the truth is, at the beginning of the world, the water did cover the whole world. God says, no, you got to move over now, you got to make room for man. But he's hoping to take that water over again. So as long as man is the real Baal he's meant to be, and shapes the world that God wants him to shape it, so the water will have no power against him. When man becomes too physical, so the water that had to stand aside but says you can wait and anticipate, well, one day he had to move over because of the greatness of man, but when man is not great, the water will once again come and destroy the world. And that's why the world was destroyed with a flood, because it was their physicality that denigrated and degenerated man. So then what will have to take him over be the ultimate Baal Tzur, the ultimate uh, Baal Homer rather. The ultimate Baal Homer would, would take it over and that's why the world was destroyed with a flood. Now, Moshe Rabbeinu has to take the Jewish people out of Egypt. So what has to happen with Moshe Rabbeinu? Moshe has to be pulled out of the water. Do you understand? You have nothing to do with water. You're on top of water. You're outside of what water is all about. The water will never take him in because he has nothing to do with Homer. Okay? And now you can begin to understand where water becomes the whole theme of Egypt. Water is the central setting. The main god of Egypt was the Nile River. What was the happiest yuntaf of the year in Egypt? The day that the Nile River did what? Overflowed its banks. It covered over the, the land to show that the physicality is, is drenching the wor their world. Of course, why? So the crops would grow so they'd have more physical pleasures. They didn't look at it as, oh, great opportunities to do chesed. You know, we wouldn't compare that lahavdo to the great um, scientific progress in Israel that's made in irrigating the Negev so that we're able to do kindness with the water and what irrigation breaks, brings. But in Egypt, it was just more to feed our narcissistic desires in life. So that's why it was the God. It was their God. It was the God of physicality. The symbol of matter was covering up Egypt, and that's what they wanted. Water was their banner. Do you understand? So now you understand why Paro chose to throw the Jewish children in the water. Right? There, there could be nothing more important to about Surah to have children who can continue on the path of being Surah. Instead, what is Paro do? He throws them into the water. Because water is the Homer. You're going to go drown into the Homer. And why do you make boys instead of girls? Ladies, don't be upset over here. Don't be upset over here what I'm going to say. But in, in terms of these terms... The man is generally called the Tsura, the woman's called the Homer, not because she's just a hunk of mass. She's greater. She allows herself to let the guy become the Tsura. Not that the woman is a hunk of mass. Don't get me wrong over here. But uh, the woman, as God asks, allow the man to think he has some kind of sh shaping and moving. But the man is associated with Tsura, the woman with Homer, and it takes a greatness to allow oneself to enable someone to be the person with Tsura. To enable the woman to allow to shape her. But be that as it may, and it needs a lot more talk. Don't, don't get out of, uh, you know, out of sync from that one term. But the men are called about to and he wanted to kill those precisely. So now you understand, when Hashem has to strike the Egyptians with the ten plagues, who's he going to strike first? He's going to strike the water. He's going to strike the God. Right? And then what must happen for the Jewish people to be free? You understand the beauty of this? It all started with water, right? It all started with water. Let's go back, 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 way back. Four, five, six, seven, eight parts. Go to Parsons Mekates. What was Pars dream about? 
The Jim is by the water. Right? And the, and the cows go out of the water. Everything is water. Everything is water. Because that's what it is. It's, it's homer. It's physicality. So what has to be the last thing we see that happens? What's the last page of Egypt? What has to happen? The Jews come right to the sea. Right to the raging waters of the Sea of Reeds. And what would the Jews have to do? They have to cross through the water. What does that mean? It means for years you were thrown into the water. For years you, the Jews were made into Chomer. A people who are a people of Tzura. Descendants of Aram, Yitzhak, and Yaakov were shapers and makers of the world. Were relegated to becoming just this hunk of mass. So what will be the fitting ending? They were going to cross that water and the water will split. For mankind, just like the water split on the second day of creation. Third day of creation. The water said we have to make room for, for, the, for the tzura. And now Hashem says it's time to start it again. The Jewish people are about to emerge. It's the people of tzura. The sea must split for them. And about tzura can go right through because they're going with Hashem's command. Hashem tells them to jump in. The waters must step aside. Interesting. What do we call Jews? Jews are called Ivrim. Ivrim. Take the word Ivrim. The first three letters is Avar. And the next two words is Yam. They cross the sea. Which is not just a cute put together of words. It's an existential understanding. A Jew crosses the sea. The water splits for the Jew. We go right through the Chomer. The Chomer has to stand aside for us. Okay? Now, and that means the world must submit now. The world is the Chomer that must split, that must submit to the Jew. Source number seven says in Tehillim, it says, Vayar ha'om, Vayar ha'yom, Vayonas, the, we say in, in Halal, the sea saw and fled. What did the sea saw? What did the sea saw? It saw the coffin of Joseph. What was the story of the coffin of Joseph? It saw the bones of Joseph. The Jews finally got it out. They saw the bones of Joseph. Why did it move away? Because Joseph was able to control his Chomer and not fall into the seductions of the wife of Potiphar and used his seichel instead. It was in that merit that the Jews would cross the sea. Obviously you understand why the Egyptians get drowned. Because they're the ultimate Chomer. So you see on the one hand, the people of Tzura can split the water, while the people of Chomer get drowned by the water, a reenactment again of the flood to them as well. Now when the daughter of Paro was bathing in the sea, the Medra says, what was she really doing? The Medra says she was fed up of her father's way and wanted to convert to Yiddishkeit. And what was she doing at the very moment that Moshe went into the water? She was using the water as a mikvah to finish her conversion process. They don't ask me who the Bezdin was and things like that. That's, that's technical questions. But that's what she was doing. Not another coincidence. Now we understand the idea of a mikvah. When a mikvah, we have many times use of a mikvah. When a non-Jew becomes a Jew, when a woman who's been controlled by the chomer of the physical period in her life now goes to the mikvah, and for that matter, when a Jew falls into a state of ritual impurity of tumah, these are all coming from chomer. These are all things of Homer. The non-Jew is more into the Homer of the world as opposed to the Jew who is the Tzura. The woman who's been controlled, so to speak, by external forces temporarily, as it were, has been exposed to Homer. People who become Tomei have exposed to Homer. So now you go into the water. Now let's think about this for a minute. And so at first blush, look what's going on over here. It looks like the water is going to drown you. That you've got to totally be submerged in the water. If you're not totally submerged, it doesn't work. So you have to first go into the water, totally stay in the water, and in theory, if you would stay there forever, you would die. God forbid. Right? It looks like when you start, you're being conquered by the water. Right? You're in the water. The water has you. And to a certain extent, the person was at a state temporarily where the Homer was controlling you to a certain degree against your will, not against your will, whatever so you're caught by the water now when does the person become kosher, when does a woman become pure exactly when does anyone going to the mikvah when do you become pure, when you're in the water and submerged in the water what if at that moment, theoretically theoretically a person with stomach wanted to eat some holy food in the water 
And you can't do this. With a, when is the person considered tahar? When they're covered by the water? No. The halacha is when you come out of the water. Even though you've been covered by the water, you, you're still not, you don't make a bracha yet because you haven't done anything yet. Even when you're in the water, you haven't done anything yet because now you're still submerged by the water. The kosherness of the Jew. When does the convert become the Jew? What if, what if God forbid, God forbid, the convert goes in, goes into the water, gets a heart attack under the water, never came out? Be an interesting question. I don't know if it ever happened. But from a lot point of view, they probably would not be considered a Jew. Because they didn't come out of the water alive. The moment you become Jewish is when you come out of the water. The mikvah procedure to be complete, you have to be totally submerged to show that the water is capable of drowning you and in the past has been drowning you. But notice when you come out of the water, you're making a statement that you are the master of the water. That's so important. That's so important. That should be the machshav. Every woman goes to the mikvah, especially on the day you want to conceive, to say, why do I want to have a child? Why do I, have a child? Why do I want to be intimate? It's not just... Intimacy is one of those things that you know can go drastically in one way or the other. It could be a very gross, physical, unpure activity, or it could be the greatest union of two souls that are using the body as a medium. So you're going out of the mikvah to say that you're tzur, you're not homer. And if you don't dress in certain ways and, and you're modest in certain ways, because a person with tzura understands that.